Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, is everyone having a, a good time so far at CSGA 2016? Um, I'd like to, at this point to share something about one of our partners that CSGA started working with over the past year, the Infosys Foundation USA. Uh, like all of us here, uh, the foundation is passionate about supporting computer science for all. Since 2015, the foundation has been helping children, young adults, and educators become creators of technology and places special emphasis on helping those in historically underrepresented communities. The foundation's three initiatives, I'm sorry, the foundation's initiatives cover three areas. Teacher training and support, where they partner with organizations like CSTA, Code.org, NSF, DonorsChoose.org, Bootstrap, ECS, and many more. Student learning opportunities, supporting hands-on learning and computer science, coding, and making. And thought leadership, bringing together like-minded computer science advocates at crossroads to explore ideas and recognizing makers through uh, Infi Makers, the Infi Maker Awards and uh, Why I Make campaign. And so at this point, I'm, I'm very delighted to introduce to you our final CSGA uh, keynote speaker, Vandana Sikha. Vanna serves as the chairperson of the Emphasis Foundation USA. She also has an undergraduate and a master's in computer science. She's a board member of Code.org, is head of a tech startup, and a full-time mom to two boys. Her passion is to make computing education more widely and easily accessible because she believes that education is, the, is a great equalizer to help bridge inequality develop the skill sets needed for the future, and open up new opportunities. We are so delighted to have Vandana here today. So please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, for the lovely introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is truly a privilege and an honor to be here amongst all of you. All of you, the amazing people who shoulder the responsibility of empowering our students with the skills they need to create an awesome future, a very digital future, and to thrive in it. I'm here today, as Mark said, not just as a representative of Infosys Foundation USA, which is deeply committed and invested to the CS for All movement, but I'm here today also as the daughter of a teacher. I grew up appreciating the significant role that teachers play in shaping our society, in the lives of our students, and in shaping the future. I'm here today also as a CS professional. I have studied computer science for six years. I have witnessed firsthand the positive impact that my CS education has had on my life, even though I studied it more than 20 years ago. I am from that thin band of women in technology, the band that we are all trying to expand. I have lived a Silicon Valley dream and I look forward to the day when we will see equal participation from women in technology and STEM jobs. But most importantly, I'm here today. What makes me more proud to be here today is as a mother. I have two boys, both in the public school system. I'm deeply committed to their education, as I am to the education of all children of the world. I want nothing more than for them to succeed in the future that I hope that they will create along with other children of the world. So how are we going to do this? I'm here to talk about this and offer you perhaps some new insights, some new perspectives into things that you might already know about. I will make five points. No big deal, just five points. My first point is to highlight what the word computer and computer science really means. The computer is our greatest invention. You know, I imagine all of you know that and it is certainly our greatest amplifier. It is the ultimate machine, and yet for some reason we, we box ourselves into a very limited view of what a computer is. And to help make my first point, I want to play a video by a living legend, a pioneer in computing, Turing Award winner, Alan Kay. I asked Alan to describe what a computer really is because some people seem to think that it is just a box of tin and plastic with a keyboard and a screen. So if you can please play the first video. <laughs> In fact, we definitely want to think beyond laptops, tablets, and smartphones. 
Because most people use them just as conveniences for various kinds of media, like automating the post office, the telephone, automating uh, rec mu music recording, videos, and everything else, and almost never for what computers can really do, all they ever see is the manifestation of computers. They don't see computers themselves. And in fact, focusing on the box is a bit of a mistake because the music is not in the piano. The music is actually in Sam, and music is about singing inside, even if you're playing. And so computers are music instruments whose music is ideas, then we have to help people learn idea music and to learn to sing ideas inside. And people have been doing this for a long time. We're all aware of the abacus, and it goes back not just to the Middle Ages, but it also goes back to Roman times. Those little uh, pebbles there are called calculi. Guess what the, What you did with it was called? Uh, the Greeks had it also, and so even though their way of writing numbers was not so good, they computed in a way that showed that they did understand what the, the number zero was good for. And here's the Antikythera, which is a computing device uh, also from that period uh, that computes the movements of the planets, of the moon, even calculates the Olympiads, and the reconstructions of it are quite beautiful. At a school a few years ago, uh, some fourth grade children were upset uh, that the sprinklers would often go on when it was raining. This became a class project, and here's one of the best solutions that they came up with. See here, the, there's a plunger on a spring, and the spring pushes it up, and the sprinkler can go. But if there's a lot of water in there, it pushes the plunger down. It blocks the flow of the sprinkler. And you can see this is a kind of a logic gate that this water here but no water here will give you water here but water here and water here will give you no water here and here's what the uh, child who thought this up looks like Jamaica age 10 in fourth grade her mother just told me that she's now at JPL and you can make the same kind of deciding and doing machines out of ropes so see, if we pull on this rope, it'll pull it. If we pull on this rope, it'll pull it. If we pull on both of it, then it'll pull it. So this is the OR function. But here, if we pull on one, it will slide on the pulley. So we have to pull on both. So that's the AND function. And here, if we pull on it, it goes in the other direction. So that's an inverter. And we can make circuits out of it. These ropes, here's one that um, does uh, part of addition. We can do the same thing with Tinker Toys. Here we can see that a push with this will move it, a push with this will move it, a push with both will move it. So that's also an OR, but done in Tinker Toys. Push it this way, it goes the other direction. So that's an inverter. We can make things out of that. And here's a whole Tinker Toy computer made by Danny Hillis and Brian Silverman many years ago that's now in the Computer History Museum. And one of the things that computing is really important for is to make and give us things that will help us to think better. That's what we need to do. So Alan has such a unique perspective on things, and I love the way he is able to articulate such things so beautifully. I love this definition, computer as an idea machine. So thanks, Alan. So to reiterate Alan's point, here is what computers have basically looked like for decades, a box of tin and plastic, basically with a screen and a keyboard. But as Alan said, it is not the only form or shape that a computer can exist in. Here is what Danny Hillis, another pioneer of computing, has said about computers. Let me give you a few seconds to read that. So he said, a computer is a device that accelerates and extends our processes of thought. It is an imagination machine that can become almost anything that we can imagine. And this is the Antikythera mechanism. Alan also mentioned this in his video. This is one of the earliest mechanical manifestations of a computer. And recently, they also discovered that this was, in fact, a living textbook. And that was more than 2,000 years ago. 
Here we see another early computer, and I imagine everyone here in this room is very familiar with this. The world's first computer program was written on this by Lady Ada Lovelace. Actually, let me say that again. The world's first computer program was written by a woman. And not only that, she actually invented the whole concept of programming. We should probably have her picture put in every computer lab, perhaps, just to make in the point around diversity. This is a memory core that was made out of rope, another mechanical implementation of a computer. And this was used by NASA in the 1960s and the 1970s. And by the way, this was also programmed by women. So what you saw were all mechanical implementations of a computer so far. The shape of a computer can also be anything that we can imagine. And kids, of course, have the best imagination. So what you see here are actually computers made by little children using Raspberry Pis. I think you guys had like a workshop on Raspberry Pi, and I think that must have been awesome for all of you to learn and to take back to your students. So what you see here is computers in the shape of a drone, in the shape of a solar smart meter, or a microwave oven, and many other implementations. And this, of course, needs no introduction. The earliest cell phones were phones with a little bit of digital technology. What you see here is not a phone. It is actually a computer in the shape of a phone. In fact, these phones are more powerful than the supercomputers that were around when I was studying CS 20 years ago. Thermostats, everyone knows those. We've seen those for decades. That is not a thermostat. That is a computer in the shape of a thermostat. Programmable, self-learning, sensor-driven, and Wi-Fi enabled. And by the way, you can see the processor that all these slides that I showed you, they have the processor information on each slide. Here we have a computer in the shape of a car. <laughs> we now have technology companies that are making cars. Who would have thought that? And we will very soon see more technology companies becoming car companies. So as you can see, a computer can take the shape of almost anything that we can imagine. Another important aspect of computing that is often overlooked, that we don't talk about that often, is that the price performance of computing has been improving dramatically, exponentially, for the last 50 years. And all this because of a prediction made by this one man, Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel. Back in 1965, I think that might have been seven years before I was born, he wrote a paper that predicted that the price performance of computing will double every two years. In one of the greatest engineering feats of humanity, engineers have kept this going for so long. In fact, they have done better than double every two years. What this means is that the smartphones today are more powerful than the supercomputers from 20 years ago, and this trend will continue beyond Moore's law as well. Our children who are in elementary school today will in the future work on computers that are 10 to 20 times more powerful, cheaper, and smaller. Computing in the large, here you see giant servers, massive cloud data systems. As performance improves, size becomes smaller, we have the ability to capture and process massive amounts of data. And hence, we have created these giant systems that now process all the world's data. It is estimated that the four to five of the largest, biggest tech companies in the world collectively spend more than $20 billion on infrastructure every year, purchasing more than 20 million servers every year. I hope that someone is paying attention to this problem of electronic waste, because one thing is for sure, in a few decades, we might be leaving behind a junkyard of all this stuff for our poor children to clean up. And at the other end of the spectrum, here you see the smallest computer in the world, the M3, the micro moat made by some researchers at the University of Michigan. It is a full working computer, and it is only one cubic millimeter in size. In the first picture, you see that little computer sitting on top of an American dime, just to give you a sense of its relative size. In the future, we can easily imagine that in a glass of beverage, we could be drinking many of these computers, consuming them, going inside our body, monitoring our body systems through another application or a device. So together, these massive cloud systems and tiny computers are powering the digital revolution. What you see in the last box, these are devices and apps that have become possible because of computing in the small.